Welcome to the latest edition of Don't Take This as Gospel. I'm Mike Partika, and we're covering an interesting question today. Can you be a Christian porn star? And the reason we're covering this today is because I came across this tweet, and oh my goodness, Brandy Love, who is a porn star and who professes to be a Christian, is answering this person's question, how is making pornography conservative or Christian? Now, the reason that uh, the person's bringing up conservative is because she recently got booted out of a Talking Points USA conference that was uh, kind of geared towards minors. It was a student assembly type thing. And uh, she bought a VIP ticket to it, I presume to get VIP access to some of the speakers who were there. And uh, she professes to be both conservative and Christian, but they didn't want her there, so they refunded her her money and canceled her ticket. Now, as far as all of that goes, I'm kind of of two minds about that, because I can understand how it might look bad for if you are a socially conservative group to be associated with somebody uh, on, on a VIP status level, even though she wasn't going there as a performer, she was going there as a audience person, but still having somebody with VIP status like that in the uh, crowd might have looked bad for them. Uh, but on the other hand, she paid for a ticket just like anybody else paid for a ticket. I mean, yes, there were going to be minors there, but again, she wasn't going as a performer. Uh, I'm not sure that they really should have reacted in the way that they did. I mean, you wouldn't just ban a porn star from Chuck E. Cheese just because there's going to be kids there. So uh, I, I don't know. That That's something that I'm of two minds about. What I'm not of two minds about is this whole idea that you can justify being a Christian pornography worker and the justification that she gives is 1 Corinthians 7.17. Now kudos for at least trying to quote from the Bible to make your justification, at least then you seem to sound sincere, but oh my gosh, uh, this verse, nevertheless each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them just as God has called them. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. Using this verse, this verse from this particular chapter of the Bible, this is from the New Testament book of Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, this whole chapter is one of the primary chapters of the Bible that talks about sexual morality. And for her to pull this verse in support of being a Christian porn star is just, it takes so much balls to do that kind of thing that I actually had to go look up some of her work just to see whether or not she was trans. That's how much balls it took. So. Let's go to the text from which she was quoting. The text is that I'm going to be bringing out is 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 3, and blah, 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 various verses. Now, you might already be looking at me and saying, okay, Mike, you just accused her of pulling a, a, a verse out of the context. Aren't you doing the same by not quoting the whole section from Corinthians? It's like, look, okay, I would love to go over 1 Corinthians 7, verse by verse, taking it apart, piece by piece, showing you what every part means in relation to every other part. But we are not going to do that today. So let's just get down to the brass tacks and start looking at the relevant portions of the text. And again, you should do your own homework after every one of these. So again, don't take this as gospel. You need to go look this up. This is from the NIV translation of the Bible. You go ahead and read the whole chapter if you like, but I'm just going to quote the salient portions. Now, the Apostle Paul in this letter is saying, hey, you, the Corinthians, wrote to me, it is good not to have sexual relations. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent and for a limited time, so that Satan will not tempt you. Now, what Paul is saying here is that the Corinthians wrote to him and saying, well, it's good not to have sex, right? 
because a lot of the Corinth, you know, back in those days, there was a lot of wondering about whether sex was just too carnal a thing that spiritual people should be involved in or not. Uh, it, it was something that had been used in various pagan worship practices, and and there were people who were just thinking that maybe maybe this is too fleshly. Maybe this is a a, a fleshly type thing that marriage altogether is an institution that should be done away with and people should just be celibate. And again, Christianity started as an apocalyptic cult, so they were thinking that Jesus' return was going to be right around the corner and history was going to end and then, you know, everybody was going to be taken up to heaven as they were. So there was really no reason to start families and have children and go through all of that struggle. And even the Apostle Paul talks about marriage in those terms in this very chapter, not not in any of the verses that we're going to cover, but he basically says, you know, it's stressful to be married. Uh, you have to worry about your, your wife and kids. The, the wife has to worry about pleasing her husband and taking care of the children. And, you know, if you stay unmarried, all you have to worry about is pleasing God. But the thing is, is that some people have a sex drive. They do. I mean, that's part of how many people are geared is to want sex. And so Paul is saying since sexual immorality is occurring, in other words, people are going out and they're having sex when they're not supposed to be because the Bible is very, very clear that sex is something that's only supposed to occur within marriage and marriage is only ever defined heterosexually. So Paul is saying if you are a person who has a sex drive, then you should be married and releasing, having your sexual release in that way. And it is a duty to each other for, for of, that husband and wife have to each other to provide that sexual release for each other, which is why he also admonishes them, do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a limited time. Like, you know, if you want to spend a, spend a week in prayer or something like that, then you could do that so that Satan will not tempt you. I mean, the whole idea is you are you have to save sex for marriage. So if you are a person who feels like he needs to have sex, well, then you need to go out and get yourself a wife. Or if you're a woman who feels like she needs sex, you need to go out and get yourself a husband. So, Paul says, I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all of you were as I am. Now, what does he mean, as I am? Well, he means, unmarried and and not really compelled to marry because there there are some people who are really not that interested in sex they're just they don't have that desire they don't have that passion so he's basically saying for those of you who do uh get married i'm not telling everyone to get married i'm saying that if you are the kind of person who unlike myself needs sex then go get married you know, that's what marriage is for, to, to provide that legitimate outlet for sexual release. Paul continues, Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever the situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. Now, this is the uh, line that was quoted back up in the tweet. And the next, the immediate next sentence is, this is the rule I lay down in all the churches, but that's not really relevant here. So, nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. For example, circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. Now, this was a big distinction back in the day, because it was the Jews who were circumcised, and it was the Gentiles who were not circumcised, and there was some confusion in the early church about whether or not you needed to get circumcised to really be a Christian. And uh, Paul is basically saying here, no, 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 no. You know, whether you're a circumcised Jew or an uncircumcised Gentile, that doesn't matter. You shouldn't be trying to, you know, like, not cross the streams, literally speaking, but you don't need to worry about either way. If you were circumcised as a Jew and now you're a Christian, don't worry about it. If you're uncircumcised, you don't worry. You have, to, have to worry about getting circumcised. Keeping God's commands is what counts. Are you pledged to a spouse? Do not seek to be released. Are you free from such a commitment? Do not look for a spouse. But if you do marry, you do not sin. So when Paul says, nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever the situation the Lord has assigned to him, the main thing that he means in this passage is, are you married? Well, then stay married. Are you unmarried? 
well then you don't have to marry, but you can if you want to. But at no time does Paul say, if you are in a position where you are having sex outside of marriage, which is wrong, then you have to continue in that position where you are having sex outside of marriage. That's, it, it, it's just absolutely ridiculous to think that. Now, one of the things that's very important here is that Paul says, you know, keeping God's commands is what counts. Now, what counts as God's commands? Well, Jesus actually tells us explicitly what we can take to be at least a subset of God's commands because in Matthew 19, 16 through 19, a man comes up to Jesus and asks Jesus, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? And Jesus replies, if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. And then of course the man says, which ones? Because, you know, there are a lot of them in the, in the uh, Bible. I think there's about, uh, what, 613 uh, different commandments. And uh, this guy is basically saying, okay, well, which? And Jesus replies with a small subset, which mostly comes out of the Ten Commandments, but, but there's also a verse from uh, Leviticus. He says, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, let's take a look at you shall not commit adultery because, you know, as it happens, uh, Brandy Love is married and uh, the, person whom, the persons whom she performs with are not her husband. So at least not always her husband. I don't know if her husband ever actually participates in any of her videos, but uh, she definitely gets around with men who are not her husband. So uh, what does Jesus define as adultery? Well, we can look there to Matthew 5, 27 through 30. And Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Okay, there's the bare bones commandment, which should be enough to discourage someone from in, who is married from engaging in sex with other men for money, but let's keep going. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now, put it all together and what do we have? Isn't this porn that he's talking about? Because think about it. What do you do with porn? You look at a woman lustfully and you make some pretty good use of your right hand. Well, depending on your handedness, it could be your left hand. But this is basically what guys do for porn. This is like, this is for all those guys who are basically saying, well, I'm not actually going out and screwing these other women. I'm just looking at them and, you know, pleasuring myself. Well, Jesus brings it all home right here and says, look, even that is adultery. It's not adultery in the physical sense, but it's definitely adultery in the spiritual sense. And the important thing to realize here is that this Brandy Love person is in a career that is all about pushing people to commit adultery the way Jesus has defined adultery here. This, this whole porn industry is about getting people to behave on a spiritual level in this adulterous fashion. So it is causing people to stumble and commit adultery. Now, what does the Bible say about causing people to stumble? Well, nothing good. Jesus in Matthew 18, seven says, woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. So. Yeah, you're causing some to, somebody to stumble. You're not a, you're not looking at a good outcome for yourself. Romans 19:20 20 to 21. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. This is the Apostle Paul talking. Do not destroy the work of God. It is better not to do anything that will cause your brother or sister to fall. So, if viewing porn 
is something that causes people to fall because it is adultery. It is exactly what Jesus says you must not do if you expect to inherit eternal life, then you should not be involved in an industry that is creating the kind of material that will entice people to do that. And likewise, Paul says, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble. And, you know, good luck thinking that porn is something that you could do for the glory of God. Christians are never called to engage in sin for the glory of God. Now, when Christians do sin, what do you do with those sinners? Well, as it happens in 1 Corinthians 5, there is the case of a person who is sinning, and sinning quite grievously, even in terms of the morals of the day. This is the Apostle Paul writing, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. That's people outside the church, people who are non-Christians. Non-Christians don't even tolerate this. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. Uh, assumedly, that's his stepmother. Hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Now, what Paul is saying here is that we are going to cut this guy off from the fold. We are going to turn this guy over to the outside world, and he can go live with them. Because in, in the early days of Christianity, Christianity was a very communal religion. It was it, The people tended to live in communes where they all supported one another mutually. It was kind of these, these hippy-dippy kind of commune type places. The apostles would take all the income and then they'd redistribute it as much as uh, to, to whoever they wanted and uh, or whoever needed it. It was it was very much kind of a socialistic communistic system, but everyone had property rights still. You didn't have to give up whatever it is that you earned for yourself. That's made very clear in Acts 5, but uh, it, it was something that a lot of people did do voluntarily was to give over their property or sell their expensive property and then give it to the apostles and the apostles would redistribute that to people who needed it. Now, what Paul is saying here is we are not going to support someone. We are not going to allow this person to continue in our fellowship if that person is going to continue sinning like this, if this person is going to continue being sexually immoral. And Paul now refers back to a previous letter that unfortunately we don't have. He says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not meaning the people of this world who are immoral. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a Christian, but is sexually immoral. Do not even eat with such people. So Christians who are sexually immoral, and I, I would argue that that category uh, is sometimes not taken to be as broad as, as it should be, because I'm sure there are a lot of Christians out there who are allowed to continue in their, in their churches in some form of sexual immorality or another and are never called to account for it. But those people are supposed to be ejected from the church. And Paul even talks about those outside. He says, what business is it, is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside, but expel the wicked person from among you. And so Christians in the church setting are supposed to be judging the members who are within the church. And this is something that even Jesus says. Because if you go to Matthew 18, 15 through 17, you have Jesus giving pretty much exactly the same instructions, generally speaking, not just talking about sexual immorality, but about any kinds of sin. He says, if a Christian sins, point out their fault. If they will not listen, take one or two others along as witnesses. Now, why do that? Well, because you might actually be the one at fault, or, or you may be wrong about that Christian being at fault. So, so having the one or two witnesses along with you will at least confirm that if they are both taking your side, then they can say, okay, yeah, you are actually right to point out this Christian's faults. Now, if the Christian who is sinning still refuses to listen, tell it to the church. This is the church hierarchy at that point, like the pastor and, and the deacons, those, those people who are in authority. And if the sinning Christian refuses to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. In other words, eject the person from the fold. Now, why so harsh a treatment? Why is it that Christians who are engaged in serious sin are treated are supposed to be treated this way by the congregation 
Well, it's because the capacity of people to deceive themselves into thinking they're on the right path is rampant. There are so many people out there who are thinking, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm doing good, I mean, yeah, I'm engaged in this activity, or yeah, I'm engaged in that activity, but, you know, my heart's really with the Lord, and, you know, I, I really feel in love with Jesus and all that kind of stuff, you know, because it is just a bunch of crap. And Jesus himself says so. When he's talking about people like this in Matthew 7, uh, 21 through 24 and 26, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So, I mean, it's like, you don't want to be going to heaven and then, you know, here's Jesus walking along and all of a sudden here's your scrub ass reaching up around for a hug and saying, oh, Lord, Lord, and Jesus like, oh, get away. So Jesus continues here. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. And look at the emphasis here. The one, only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, only the one who puts his words into practice, they are the ones who Jesus will accept. It's not going to be the people who hear day after day that sexual immorality is wrong. It's not going to be the ones who read in the Bible that adultery is wrong and that they should you know, cast off their, their, their right eye or their right hand into, uh, and cut it off or else have their whole body go into hell. It's not going to be the people who read those words and then do nothing about it. It's not going to be the people who read those words and then continue in the careers that support those sins and encourage those sins who are going to be accepted by Jesus. Those are the people who are going to get this reaction. So, I hate to say it, Brandy Love, but you are not on the right path and you need a wake-up call, and hopefully this will be it for you if you ever do actually see this. So, if you want to see any more of my work exposing hypocrisy, check out my two books against the Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Holding God in Accurate Knowledge and The Testimony of History to the Souls in Hell. They both deal with particular doctrines that they have relied on at least in the case of the Trinity, have relied on early church fathers to support their views, except those early church fathers actually support the opposite of their views. And the same thing goes in the case of the Trinity to the views of the existence of the eternal soul and an eternal hell. Uh, these are things that the Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe in, but things that these church fathers clearly did believe in. So, uh, do go to the link uh, to the Amazon page that I've got in the video description and pick yourself up a copy of these books. So thank you for listening to Don't Take This as Gospel. I'm Mike Partika. Do subscribe so that you can be notified for later uh, videos, and I will talk to you later.